It's important that we stay in touch with the activities and decisions being made in Washington, D.C. that affect our industry, such as the latest announcement on fresh beef imports from Paraguay. A lot of this beef that's coming through Paraguay actually begins in Brazil. Leah Biondo and Jess Peterson with the U.S. Cattlemen's Association join us to provide insight on several topics like the new House Speaker Johnson. How will he be for our cattle industry, as well as the ability for him to collaborate with both his party and the House as a whole? I think if, if, if the members in the House uh, will understand it's a long game, not a short game, they'll have a successful route. And what's the future of the next farm bill with so much going on this next year? There's a lot to talk about, and we're going to get through as much as we can on this episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. And this is the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. We're glad to have you tuned in and joining us on our program today. Before we jump right into it, did want to let you know how the things will go here today. Later on in the show, the Captain Tim O'Burn will be in with this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. We'll also hear from meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. Well, I'll tell you what, he has been awful good to us here in the weather category. We have been able to get a lot of things done here on our place in this uh, good weather that we've had this fall. We've got calves weaned. we got cows cows preg checked i got the opens hauled to the sale barn and we're just sitting back and we are going to enjoy our thanksgiving week and i hope for all of you and your family and friends you have that same opportunity as well well turning now and introducing our guest joining us on the program today leah biondo who is the executive vice president of the u.s cattlemen's association and jess peterson their senior policy advisor guys thanks for joining us here today on the work and ranch radio show Always great to be here, Justin. Thank you for the invitation, as always. All right. Well, I got a hold of you guys to talk about several different topics that I think as we're different issues have come to the forefront, a lot of things happening back in D.C. that we wonder how is that going to affect us here on the ranch? And so we're going to start first of all. Leah, I'll go to you first, because when we had talked last week, when we were talking about this, you said, hey, let's uh, we're going to talk about this latest USDA news that was coming out. And I'll have you just kind of explain what that is a little bit it came out late last week and uh, explain what that is and how that's going to affect us here in the countryside yeah so some pretty exciting news uh the usda released what they're calling a competition package or a competition initiative and uh you know there's uh three main components to it we're gonna skip one of them because i don't know how many of us are ranch raised and poultry out there but <laughs> yeah. uh, it has to deal with poultry growers <laughs> the other two though are really impactful to the livestock industry that competition package first and foremost is going to establish a chief competition officer at usda's agricultural marketing service now this position is going to be hired as a career rather than a political appointee Uh, and what that means is it's not going to switch up from administration to administration right now we've been very fortunate to have a white house appointed senior advisor for fair and competitive markets That's Mr. Andy Green, who comes to us from outside the agriculture industry. So it's been great to get his perspective and how we can continue to improve competition within the livestock marketplaces. So having this chief competition officer and having it be a career position and basically institutionalizing Andy's position there at USDA, is going to be really critical to help um, the department uh, elevate competition related concerns. Mm-hmm. I know one of the things and I'm just reading the press release that w- that you all had sent out. I know your president, current president right now, the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, Justin Tupper mentioning in there, there was something in there in regards to just some concern of foreign ownership is really, and we're seeing that even statewide, state legislatures really getting proactive in this. Now we're seeing from the national side of things. There's some addressing of that, I believe, as well. Yeah, so one of the things that our president um, published in a recent article here is that, you know, we've got this foreign land ownership issue, but we also have a foreign um grocery store ownership issue, if you will. Um, And one of the provisions within this competition package is that it's going to require the Agriculture Marketing Service to make sure that they are purchasing meat that is born, raised, and harvested in the United States for its purchasing program. So think like um, supplemental nutrition programs, 
food aid programs, international aid programs for all the reasons that USDA has to purchase large amounts of of beef and, and other meat. Uh, they're going to make sure that that meat and beef really does come from animals that have been born, raised, and harvested in the U.S. And this is important now, Justin, because a recent audit report that came out earlier this year by the Office of Inspector General at USDA found that the Agriculture Marketing Service did not have an adequate process in place to confirm those origin claims. So we saw at least, at least... $16 million worth of commodity purchase where the origin claims were not able to be verified. Um, so that's concerning. And we're, we're pretty excited that this competition package is going to address that, uh, because that $16 million could have been bought from an independent processor here in the United States. So, uh, you know, this administration has really been working through its action plan for a fairer and more competitive marketplace. This is one of those action items on that action plan. So we look forward to working with USDA to, to hammer out the rest of that action plan and really get a, a fair and competitive marketplace going. Yeah. Leah, quick question on that. As you were talking about that and and having that confirmation in there of where this meat is coming from, as you said that the meat is born, raised and slaughtered here in the U.S., is there anything in place that's that they can do that or is that what's going to happen is that's going to be formulated because of this so that we have a little bit better really that knowledge that that is that's what's happening right that's a great question so right now the government procurement rules do state that you have to purchase american made goods uh, anytime you're using federal or taxpayer dollars but the issue is the product of the USA definition for beef products specifically doesn't give us much to go on in terms of being able to verify that origin. So right now, as your listeners well know, the product of the USA definition does allow uh, imported meat to be brought into this country, undergo some sort of transformation, whether that's cutting, wrapping or trimming. And then it can claim that born or that product in the USA label. So. This uh, this new standard for government procurement purchases um, would update that definition for born, raised, and slaughtered in the U.S. And USDA is looking at a product of the USA rulemaking. That's thanks mm-hmm. to U.S. Cattlemen's Association's uh, petition for rulemaking that we submitted back in October of 2019, if you'll believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, we're we're looking forward to the results of that final rule on product of the USA labeling definitions. And we're thinking the announcement that was released this week is kind of pointing to where that definition is going to end up. Mm -hmm. Leah, the next question, if I'm not, I'm probably not the only guy in the countryside hearing what you're saying and thinking we're really approaching and getting close to some framework for country of origin labeling as well. Is, am I wrong in assuming that? I don't think you're wrong. I think what this administration is trying to do and what we've heard from them multiple uh, through multiple meetings with the U.S. Trade Representative, with Secretary uh, Vilsack, we've heard them trying to find that trade compliant country of origin labeling program. And that's really important because we still have tariffs the threat of tariffs hanging over our head from Canada and Mexico back when the World Trade Organization in 2015 uh, ruled that that mandatory country of origin labeling was, you know, not not uh, allowed due to international trade laws, if you will. So, you know, we still have that threat of tariffs hanging over us and we have to be very careful about how we define product of the USA. But product of the USA is a voluntary definition. It's not a mandatory definition. And there's no reason that it shouldn't um, really speak to the truthful, transparent, honest labeling of the product that it is put on. Yeah. Leah, since I have you on and we've been dancing around this topic a little bit of international beef coming in, other foreign beef coming in, let's talk a topic that came out last week, and that is a Paraguayan beef imports that the USDA says they're going to begin importing, I think, by next month or something like that. What's your take on that? I know you're back in the in the middle of everything happening in, in Washington, D.C. What's your take on that? So the U.S. Cattlemen's Association uh, poses this reopening and this opening of uh, fresh beef importation from Paraguay. And there is 
many different reasons for it. But a lot of this beef that's coming through Paraguay actually begins in Brazil. Um, I know that, you know, there's a Brazilian beef company that operates four plants within Paraguay. Another Brazilian meat company operates two plants. Um, of the 10 large slaughter plants that are inside of Paraguay, the majority of which are Brazilian owned. So um, it, it kind of feels like it's a pass through for yeah. Brazilian beef to get here. And so we we really oppose that opening up of borders from Paraguay. Um, and again, you can take any number of reasons why, whether that's environmental issues, whether that's lower standards of production, whether that's disrupting markets here in the U.S., whether that's, you know, protecting the health of the domestic herd, there is a risk of foot and mouth disease from that country. So, um, you know, last week we did have a really high positive announcement there on competition, but I would say we're very disappointed in this rule that would allow fresh beef from Paraguay to be imported. Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I think there's a lot of a lot of folks in the industry have some concern on that and appreciate you guys continuing to kind of hawk that a little bit. Folks, we're going to take a break here. My guests today that are joining us, Leah Biondo, Executive Vice President of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, also standing by is Jess Peterson, their Senior Policy Advisor. When we come back, we have some other topics. For example, who is my Johnson. That is, of course, the, the all of the everything going on that's been going on through the summer of electing a Speaker of the House. And now we have one. It's been happen, happened a few weeks ago, but we're going to find out what his take is or what his side of agriculture is. Plus, we're going to talk Farm Bill as well and what's the progress looking like on that. As we head to break, a quick thank you to our sponsor of this segment today, Vitalix. Livestock is your livelihood. Tubs are our expertise. Vitalix, the true blue tub. Find out more at vitalix.com. We're going to take a break. We'll be back on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. There are lots of nutrition tubs out there, but none can match the true blue commitment of Vitalix. Our tubs offer you the most concentrated nutrition at the lowest cost per day. That means more profit for your operation and improved performance for your cow herd. In fact, research shows Vitalix tubs increase feed efficiency by 20% while boosting conception rates, herd health, and weaning weights. Learn more at Vitalix.com. Vitalix, the true blue tub. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. My guest today, Leah Biondo, Jess Peterson. They are with U.S. Cattlemen's Association working on behalf of that organization. Of course, as we talked about earlier in the previous segment, uh, their president is Justin Tupper. Uh, he is out of St. Ange, South Dakota. But uh, we have these folks on with us here today. And uh, Jess, well, I want to go to you now because, boy, this has been quite an issue back in Washington, D.C. It uh, unfortunately seems Seems to be very dysfunctional on top of dysfunction, if that's such a thing, and uh, <laughs> and and uh, trying to get uh, the Republicans together to nominate and elect a Speaker of the House. That was quite a, a circus there in all in itself. But we have one, and it's Mike Johnson out of Louisiana. Tell us what you know about him and, and what he knows about agriculture. Hey, you betcha. Great to be with everybody, and hope everyone's enjoying these good cattle markets here at the U.S. Cattlemen's Association. We're going to try to keep them. Uh, Keep them going strong. You just heard some really important updates there. And yes, uh, unfortunately, the dysfunction in Washington, D.C. does have, uh, so, uh, can have a negative impact on this cattle market. We saw just, just when you had uh, this disruption around the, the speaker vote and, you know, from the global perspective, it's not good. From national security, it's not good. Uh, from an economy spec perspective, it's not good. More of the markets. And so that was a key time, right about the time they were... Mm-hmm. Dinging around on this deal, they, they we you know, like booted Speaker McCarthy, and I just want to give a hat tip to Speaker McCarthy. I think he, under, he understood agriculture. He's still a member. He understands agriculture really well. Has good ties to California and across this great country. We congratulate Speaker uh, Johnson from Louisiana. You know, like anything, a lot of unknowns, but it really doesn't matter. We're very fortunate in agriculture to have a strong agriculture committee uh, with G T. Thompson there, uh, the, the the chairman. From Pennsylvania, he's very, very fluent, very well versed. The issues doesn't always quite line up with where we'd like him to, but that's again because there's a lot of uh, kind of back and forth in the house as you, as you take on kind of the corporate cow feeder mentality of the multinational meat packers. You're not always aligning with your independent cow feeders and your independent cow producers. So the good news is, the good news is 
is that we have some really good representation out and about in the house. You know, just want to call out South Dakota Tigers and Dusty Johnson. I think mm-hmm. Dusty Johnson gets this cattle industry as good as any member of Congress. Following right up with that is, is Kelly Armstrong from, from North Dakota. So I think those two members have been very active. They've been very engaged. We have some good Western members uh, in, in Congress, but but they're, it's yet to be seen how engaged they're going to be on these key issues on cattle market reform uh, and, and farm bill and the like. Now, why does this matter to have a speaker getting work done? Well, a few things. Uh, uh, the cattle market doesn't react very well to potential government shutdowns, right? Yeah. So we still have to navigate Speaker Johnson still has to navigate this upcoming appropriations package. And so that's going to be key. Uh, the farm bill is for sure going to be a one-year extension. We, we've picked up on that. Uh, again, we need this certainty. We need to work through that piece. Very, very important that we don't delay on that a lot. Now we're bumping it into an election year, which makes it even more challenging. Regardless, we're going to work on it. We've got some key components. So going back to just a little bit about the speaker, I, we're, you're in a kind of an interesting place where it used to be a little bit more kind of respect and understanding of, of the speaker uh, navigating these votes. I think the unfortunate thing that happened here uh, last month when, when we removed Speaker McCarthy was now it doesn't quite matter who's in that gap. There's a gang of members in Congress right now that say, well, if we don't get it our way, you're out. Mm-hmm. And so it remains to be seen. It doesn't really quite generally matter who's speaker uh, if, if there's this mentality. So I would encourage all of you in listening country to, to really say, look, you know, if, if, if the speaker is going to follow along uh, with the members, with the policies and get 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 things moving in the right direction, let's not get too pie in the sky about ideas and concepts. And I think that's what kind of bucked McCarthy off that horse is folks were, were getting confused. And then look at the look at the windows you lost for legislating. And dare I say, for some of the things that Republicans would like to get advanced, you lost that window. So, again, getting back to this. I think it's going to be an interesting route forward. I think Speaker Johnson uh, has a background. He has the conservative bona fides. But yet again, he still has a Democrat Senate. So you, you mm-hmm. can only go so far. I think if, if, if the members in the House uh, will understand it's a long game, not a short game, they'll have a successful route. I think there's good members across the West and across this country that can inform them on these farmer and ag policies. I think he's going to defer to them. And as long as there's some stability and working through these and not too much of a bump on a government shutdown, this market's going to remain strong. Yeah. So, Jess, I guess the next question I would have is, are they going to be able to work together after everything that's transpired in this? And I'm sure there's got to be some some bad blood. I mean, for crying out loud, you can't go through these kind of situations without folks having some hurt feelings or some hard feelings over everything that's happened. But are we going to see some things work, worked out or work together on this? Or there is there going to continue to be some individualism that is starting to that we're seeing not only in the U.S. House, but in just politics in general? I guess back to the main question, are they going to come together, though, now that we've we've elected a Speaker of the House and put some things aside and get some work done? Yeah, I'm, I'm really surprised. And I know my listeners out there, I, I don't want to set anyone off. I really, really appreciate those who have a good conviction when it comes to, you know, how, how government, you know, there's there's kind of that aspiration with how we want government to operate. But then there's also counting votes. You know, it's, I'm always surprised sometimes when we get a little bit uh, imaginary on cattle country when we're the most realist people around, right? You got to pay your bank notes. I understand that's where the fiscal uh, you know standards come from, and it should be. But you know, wishes and hopes. I, I wish I you and I, I wish I had a large ranch that was all paid for and a whole lot of cattle. <laughs> on, but it's just not there. And so sometimes we have to look at the reality that we're dealing with. Say, well, you know, I do have a little debt, and I'm paying down. I do have to work pretty hard to get these cattle put together. I do got to truck them a long ways over some lease ground and whatnot. So there's there's kind of some. Uh, it is a bit of an uphill battle just in the cattle business, just getting your operation put together. Congress is no different. You can't just sit there and say, well, I'm going to have this whole note paid off this year. I'm going to have this done this year when it's just not reality. So for all those out there, look at what happened when we had that instability. We've got to make sure things stay on track for our exports. we got to keep our strong ag exports. Uh, this this world, this country, we, we don't we don't need the conflicts and wars that are happening. Uh, so the extent that the U.S. can keep their eye on the ball, fund uh, the good actors to push back on the bad actors. We've got to have strong markets for, for agriculture, for movements, for consumers, uh, wars and things alike. They're not helpful in that regard. So to the extent that we can keep our eye on the ball, uh, funding the aid packages that we need to find ways. And we did. We had we had cuts in these appropriation bills, find good fiscal conservative principles, but then being able to say, hey, at the end of the day, I'm closing out the year on the ranch. And this is the best we can do. That's how Congress needs to operate. Your ranch needs to operate. So I would just encourage those folks that are a little uh, a little more aspirational on how government should run and think it's neat to, to toss a speaker out. 
maybe maybe take a breath and just see what that ramification was the last go around and look to say, hey, you know what? Maybe that wasn't the best idea. Uh, jumping on that green grow course and getting out and doing shipping on them. Maybe I'll kind of tame them out a little bit and see how the long haul works. And that's what I hope for, Justin. Yeah, or a big round pen with deep sand. Uh, <laughs> if you have lots of time in there, you can do that. So I think we can we can dive into these bigger arguments and debates, but, but we really kind of backed ourselves in a corner here. So now it's time to kind of settle out it and get a little bit more realistic because we we have a good cattle market. We have some really, we have our best days and years are ahead of us. and We've had a really good run. And let's keep our eye on the ball. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're going to take a break here. Just works to take a break. But when we come back, Jess, I'm going to come back with you. I I got one more question in regards to the farm bill. And then I want to have you talk a little bit about the markets. And then Leah, we're going to go back to you because I know the U.S. Cattlemen's Association's annual convention is coming up in Fort Worth, Texas. And I want to talk about what is all in store with that. Well, as we head to break, a quick thank you to our sponsor of this segment, New Generation Supplements. And, you know, for some of you, I know you're just a month or so away from some new calves hitting the ground for others maybe it's a ways off nevertheless it's always important to know that that cow's third trimester nutrition is critical in her pregnancy as they require essential vitamins minerals and nutrients to help deliver a good healthy calf and to keep those calves thriving once they're on the ground if you want to get calving off with a good start start it with a solid nutritional program for your mother cows with new generation supplements and let me tell you they have over 70 unique formulas between between their three livestock brands of Smart Lick, Feed in a Drum, and Mega Lick, because they know that nutritional needs are different across different parts of the country. They have over 2,000 dealerships across the United States and Canada. Don't wait. Stop by your local New Generation Supplements dealer today to learn more about supplements made for successful calving seasons. We're going to take a break. We'll be back on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. You know, big cows come with big feed bills, which is why smart genetic selection can pay off in your cow herd. Did you know Simmental-influenced cows are an average 74 pounds lighter at maturity than Angus-sired counterparts, according to a recent U.S. Meat Animal Research Center study? Now, while Simmental is sized for more efficient gains, 20-year genetic trend lines also show the breed offers reliable calving ease, early growth, and cow longevity. That's a balanced herd built for profit. Sim Genetics, giving you more per head, period. Stand strong, Simmental. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. My guest today, Leah Biondo, Executive Vice President for the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, Jess Peterson, their Senior Policy Advisor. We've heard from both of them so far in our show. We're going to continue on. Jess, I've got another question. As you were talking about, we were talking about some of the instability that we saw this last maybe, well, quite a while uh, in, in Washington, D.C., uh, and and then getting a House Speaker elected. We, you, you gave us a little bit of background on that process there that's going on. And you talked about the fact that that we recognize there could be a delay of one year in that farm bill. The concern I feel a little bit is there is a lot going on, not just in the in the United States, but worldwide with uh, wars and different, you know, whether it's Ukraine or whether it's Israel. There's a lot pushing down on the finances of our country. Is there any concern that we could not see a farm bill because just everything kind of come into a head at the same time? And then you throw an election year at the same time. Well, I tell you what, that, that's, that's, that's a summary right there, Justin. I mean, yeah. I, you hit the nail on the head. Like election year, uh, some, some pretty giant uh, checks going out the door and the timing there. So, yeah, you, you hit everything on the head. I'll add one more piece to that, the, the, the bill that people might not always agree with the name of it, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA put a lot of spending, it added up, it plussed up a lot of these conservation programs, which, hey, uh, go talk to your NRCS office. They're granting from year to year as they should be. You're staffing up both from the public lands agencies to get some more range, range cons out and about work being done, very important work done on public lands in addition to technical services and conservation programs really got plussed up. So on, on a positive note, we're looking really strong for funding. We plussed up those programs in the IRA, uh, but you're absolutely correct. As we look at that next farm bill, I would, I would turn to Leah here a little bit and, and open up her to talk about that, that how we navigate that. We're very fortunate that, you know, the farm bill, it's a five-year program. It's, it's stored. There is flexibility. It's kind of how we dip into these programs, how we dip into different various buckets of funding. Uh, we're fortunate in the fact that it's not all a direct payout. Some of it is is based on, 
you know, how much is utilized, how much is supported in those programs. So there's some, so, so there's some variables there. And mm-hmm. oddly enough, a four bill actually scores better than a direct spending bill, right? And so we're, we're fortunate in that regard. And then as they go into it, in the past, it's been used as a, as a, as a deficit, deficit spending tool too, saying, well, these are offsets. We'll spend less here because we think the farm bill is going to have some, some better variables and things of that nature. So long-winded way of saying, yes, I think it's going to be very challenging to get it through an election year. I think we're very fortunate that uh, both urban and rural members see the value of, of a strong food safety net. Uh, for our for our farmers, ranchers, and our consumers, a global pressure on the conflict side uh, knows that we need to have a good good domestic domestic production. So yes, I think the price mm-hmm. tag is high. It will take some creative and clear heads, and we really got to get past these gotcha angry moments uh, because that will decimate that ability to push some hard bills across there the finish line. Lee, any thoughts from you on how that might navigate even better? You had a great overview there, Jess. You know, like you said, the farm bill. There's not a livestock title included. So it's tough for us to look at the farm bill and say, you know, this is a big piece of priority legislation for us. It is because it, you know, there there are programs within it that producers do use related to risk management programs, disaster aid, et cetera. But um, we really look at that farm bill as a vehicle to move other priorities. So, you know, when we're looking at the list of bills that we'd like to get across the finish line, those are some of the things that we've been talking to um, House and Senate Agriculture Committee staff about. And so, uh, you know, it's it's interesting, the farm bill, and mm-hmm. just did a great job of kind of explaining there why that is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You had talked a bit, uh, Jess, a little bit ago about some some optimistic things to be considering. Our markets, you know, we got to really be real with ourselves too, and we got to be fortunate that we're heading into a time here where these markets are strong, and and that's something to really be optimistic about. Oh, absolutely, no. And for each and every one of you that have had, you know, I we, we mentioned this on the show about a year ago. Stay in it. Stay in this cattle business. Do everything you can diversify. I think all of us maybe get off farm off ranch income, mm-hmm. but but being able to keep your operation together, keep keep your equipment, keep your lease, your land, uh John Lurd, so to speak. Absolutely. So we've seen some folks kind of get these notes in a better place. Uh expenses were high. They you know they softened a little bit. Feed costs, corn's coming a little softer right now for us on the feeding side and developing side. Uh, your fertilizer soft a little bit. This this fuel kind of swings a little bit too much. Uh, but absolutely what a great time to be in the cattle market. Uh, all the numbers out there showing you're seeing strong demand, strong prices, uh, certainly wrapping up 2023, end of the year ahead. A little bit of volatility on this board right now, so we, we want to kind of see that balance out. But the reality is you don't have enough heifers and cows across this country. Uh, there's There remains to be strong demand for those calves and certainly for the uh, for the replacements and the cow herd coming together. So absolutely stay in it. Uh, find find ways to make it happen. And again, U.S. Cattlemen's Association, uh, we are very, very focused, Leah referenced having this office of special counsel, this competition officer at the Department of Agriculture. Every one of those things matter because it's not having the fox guard the hen house. It's, it's the farmers in there and looking at making sure things are, are following as they should be. And we still need to get some of these market reforms in place. We've seen an increase in the past. capacity. We still have uh, some, 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 we'd like to see that cattle contract reflect the great quality of, of, of cattle being marketed, that the improvements there, we'd like to see uh, increased cash trade and some more uh, incentives to, to, to make that happen uh, and, and whatnot. So there's work to be done. That's what folks are going to be doing here in Texas. Yes, the cattle market's high uh, and where it needs to be actually, where it needs to be. But we're going to get coming into Texas here and Lee's going to talk about what's on tap to that because we cannot let off uh, the pedal to making sure we get some market reforms. We're taking advantage of it, but there's more work to be done. Yeah, for sure. And I know we had talked about that in previous shows here, uh, some updates on some of those attempt and reforms and it just it's kind of goes in and out with based upon who's kind of in control of the house or the senate and, and we kind of he- keep hitting election years every now and again when we get some footing so we got to keep the gas on on those particular issues we're going to take a break here folks when we come back i've we've got a couple more things i want to visit with leah and jess on one is uh that might be more of a western issue in regards to the blm and then also we'll talk about their upcoming u.s cattlemen's 16th annual meeting and cattle producers for that's going to be December 1st through the 2nd in Fort Worth, Texas. We'll talk about all of those things when we return on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Animal health is key to your business, so how do you track cattle health treatments? 
Stop relying on pen and paper or complicated programs. Performance Beef helps you record processing data, enter costs, and track animal health history, all in real time at the shoot. The mobile app also makes it easy to log pasture and pen treatments on the go. Your health data is integrated with feed and financial information in one easy-to-use platform, accessible from your computer, smartphone, or tablet. Find Performance Beef online to request a demo. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. My guest today, Leah Biondo, Jess Peterson, as we are talking really just a lot of different updates in our industry from a political view as well as uh, what's going on back in D.C. We've, we've covered a lot of things. If you've missed the front half of this show, you can go to our podcast site at workingranchradio.com. You can download the show from there or any podcast provider out there as well. Jess, I want to go back to you real quick uh, before we go back to Leah. Um the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, has been in the crosshairs here for the past year. Or so, Well, it's probably been in the crosshair a lot, a lot longer than that. But as far as some real big issues that have hit the West part of the uh, and in Montana, there's been a deal up there with American Prairie Reserve. Now we're dealing with issues down in uh, Nevada, even in Wyoming and Utah. And where are we at? I mean, what's your what's your guys' take? And Lee, if you want to chime in as well, because I know you're back in D.C., uh, what's your guys' take on this? And where are we seeing this in terms of it's affecting Western ranchers? Well, absolutely. I mean, it's almost by nature. It's almost like it's at the Bureau of Land Management. It's just going to be a two sides of that issue. And both sides, it, there's a lot of passion, a lot of um, back and forth involved there. And so you will you kind of see for every time there's a well-intended effort, it, it, it's two steps back. So you've had a lot of good conversation, right? I mean, if you're asked, could you diversify uh, earnings on your permit? Yeah. If you sit down and take that at face value and say, hey, could you, you know, get some carbon credits, some, some, have some additional earning uh, capabilities? Absolutely. But if it pushes back on grazing, uh, then, then there's concern. And so I think it's, it's threading the needle on that that's been difficult. Uh, I do think that uh, from the conservation planning rule side, there's, it's, it's well intended. Of course, U.S. Cattlemen's had a full summit on that this past summer. At our summer meeting and really good dialogue. We had a uh, senior policy advisor, Harold Weiss, out and discussed it. And at the end, it, it was like a lot of these discussions, heads were nodding, not seeing they're in agreement, but there was an understanding that there was a vision for it. So what we have to do now is kind of see how that plays out. Um, there's certainly a timeline, how much that will get done in this current administration. But I do know that there's been good folks working on that. There's been good input. Of course, those comments came in this this past summer. So we'll see what they look like. So that's just one of them there. So before anyone says, oh, it's the, it's the worst of times, the best of times. <laughs> that, well, we, we, we've got some options. We're putting things on the table. We just talked about some policy changes uh, that happen. These things take time and, and they're, they're sometimes co- complex to work through. Uh, as it links to the updated grazing rates, we'd certainly like to see that. That's very, very useful. It's a long time overdue. So we encourage the folks to move in that direction with Bureau Land Management to get these grazing regs uh, updated. Uh, an incredible opportunity there. And again, uh, um, uh, you know, it, it's timely, it's overdue. You know, it, it continues to be a concern. I, I think mm-hmm. when you look at the Bureau of Land Management and the and the American Prairie Reserve, at the end of the day, there's just a frustration with the American Prairie Reserve. Mm-hmm. They, they could really uh, take some important steps to be a better neighbor, right? And how they're conducting their business, and how they're working uh, with the livestock industry and, and others. So, um, I, I think where we're going with this, and I'll turn over related to anything that I haven't missed, uh, there is a con- constant need, and we're seeing this. Society for Ranch Management will have uh, Bureau of Land Management folks, really good presentation at the upcoming meeting uh, in January of 2024 at Sparks, Nevada. Go on the website for SRM and you find all the details. BLM has done an incredible job of getting their folks, getting their career staff, getting their range folks extremely involved in SRM. I think the relationship has never been stronger with society for range management and bureau land management with regards to the arrangements. I'm not saying like the whole policy where that no NGO kind of directs the policy. Mm-hmm. The BLM operates in, in its division, but its staff and its commitment to BLM to work with society for range management to make sure their range cons are getting training at SRM, are attending these meetings, are attending these workshops has never been higher. And I tip my hat to BLM on that. On the flip side, we probably need to see more uh, forums and interactions where everyone's coming together to walk through what their objectives are. I think we're all kind of getting into our corners, which we tend to do in this industry and say, well, I don't like what they're doing. That's a problem versus, okay, what are we each trying to accomplish here? So I, some, some, some room for improvement, some efforts to do the right thing. Uh, and some miscommunications, how I would uh, pull all that together on the VLM side. If Leah's got anything else to add. 
Leah? You know, Jess, I think you gave a, a stellar overview there, but uh, it's a great segue into our next conversation point here is those conversations. And, uh, you know, I won't jump ahead of Justin here, but we're really looking forward to those conversations happening in Fort Worth your next month. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not going to delay getting into that, but I did have just one quick, quick question as we're talking politics just a little bit here. And that's Tom Vilsack, the Secretary of Agriculture. That's got to be one of the toughest spots in Washington, D.C. right now, I would think, especially uh, with the administration and then some of the stuff they wanting to try to try to get done and then him have to pedal the road out there and, and try to try to get things to actually get through. Uh, what's your guys' thoughts on that? I'll turn over to <laughs> Leah on that. Absolutely. Not a, not an easy job being secretary of Ag. And you goes to say, well, I'm thank goodness you didn't bring up the part of interior. Or we're going to yeah. talk about BLM. These, these are tough positions, right? They're tough positions to navigate. What I like about Millsack's approach, he still goes back to that country boy, lawyer mentality from Iowa. When you're doing meetings with him, he, he, even when you brief him, he just kind of breaks things down as to what a country lawyer from Iowa, how you would do that in a small town in Iowa if you had your practice and you're working on a you know estate planning or a will or some type of you know, legal dispute. So he, he's very analytical in that regard. He has a passion. He's a former exec with the dairy council. So he, he truly fundamentally believes in agriculture. He believes in competition. You're seeing him making the rounds right now with his marker board and talking about how we need to do better on competition. So I think his heart is in the right place. Obviously, when you go walking over to the White House <laughs> or interacting with uh, with with White House influence, they, you know, there, there's going to be some dialogue back and forth. But I, I set my hat to this White House. Yes, there's 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 disappointment. There's frustration. Of course. Well, of course, there's going to be. But to the extent where they've given the secretary deference to move. And, you know, you're seeing this, too. This is a direct announcement from the White House on competition. Are they going far enough? Absolutely not. Are there changes they can make? Absolutely. But are we seeing a very a focused Department of Agriculture on what it means to have food production, make sure we have the reforms and move in that direction. We're getting there. So hat mm-hmm. tip to Bill Sack. He doesn't do everything right all the time. My gosh, I don't know what would happen if someone came through and they did that. I'd fall over. Um, but I'm, I I think we're in okay. I think we're in a strong place. There's still a, some unfinished business that we're going to get to. But I think he's, he's, he's the man for the job in this administration. I'll tell over to Leah. No, I agree, Just. It's not a job that anyone wants, but uh, Vilsack's doing a great job of navigating that. I also wanted to bring up, you know, just kind of the state of Congress right now. Things are in disarray, and uh, we've mentioned that a bit earlier talking about the speaker. And so having to navigate uh, congressional leadership changes, that's really commendable on on Vilsack's behalf because he he hasn't gotten distracted by some of those things that are happening in Congress, and he's going forth with the priorities that he wants to move forward with and, and not worrying about, you know, whether or not Congress is going to, you know, keep keep about business as usual. So, yeah, not not a fun job, but uh, certainly able to navigate accordingly. And, and like Jess said, you know, don't agree with all of his policies and everything that he, you know, has has pushed forward. But when would we find someone that does? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I got to commend you both. Very diplomatic answer. I appreciate that. <laughs> 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 so let's get into uh, Leah. You mentioned a bit ago about conversations and really when we and I'd mentioned last week in the show of, of encouraging people, we've got a lot of local, state, national associations having their conferences and conventions coming up. And I just would encourage people to leave yes. the ranch, leave the ranch, go go get involved. And I know your guys 16th annual meeting and cattle producers forum is coming up. It's going to be at the historic Fort Worth stockyards. That's got to be fun. Give us an overview of what's going to be happening there. That's December 1st through the 2nd in Fort Worth. Oh, we can't wait. Yep. Historic Fort Worth stockyard. So after all the business is done, you can go on head downtown, kick up your boots. Uh, but we've got a star studded lineup of keynote speakers coming to town. I'll start with one of, you know, a, a good friend of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, someone we've been working with since he was on the Senate Agriculture Committee. And that's the Commodity Futures Trading Commission Chairman, uh, Russ Benham. And he's going to be down there in Fort Worth to give an update on some of the regulatory actions that CFTC has taken this year, some of the things that they see coming in the future. It's going to be a really uh, great speech there. And I, I'm just uh, very honored that he's choosing to spend some time with us there in Fort Worth. We also have the Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs. It's Jenny Moffitt. She covers the Agricultural Marketing Service, which is a lot of what we've been talking about today. 
She also covers the checkoff program. So uh, we're hoping for a very robust mm-hmm. conversation there covering a bunch of different topics that are happening. We're also going to see uh, uh, Farm Service Agency Administrator Zach Douche. Now we yeah. were talking about risk management programs earlier. And uh, Zach, a, a former U.S. Cattlemen's Association board member, he he gets it. He's mm-hmm. been moving forward policies as quickly as he can, ones that make sense to him. And um, we're looking forward to seeing what he's got for us in Fort Worth. But if you're not so concerned about, uh, you know, who's coming to a meeting and more concerned about what it's what's in it for you, <laughs> we've got a great lineup of uh, workshops, speakers, events. One of those is a risk management workshop, of mm-hmm. course. But one of the cool things about this workshop is you get to leave with a one year complimentary subscription to beefbases.com. So you walk away with tools and calculators to help you kind of navigate the market here coming up. Um, and really uh, get to learn from from some of the best there. We've got Ag Risk Advisors coming, Brett Crosby with Custom Ag Solutions. Uh, and they'll be there to answer your questions and kind of walk through some of those best management practices that producers can use to uh, minimize their risk and, and maximize their mm-hmm. profit. We're also going to be talking about mRNA technology and livestock vaccines. And this is quite the issue and one of deserving of our attention for yeah. sure. Um, as we've already talked about, we had a viral tweet kind of go, go make the rounds earlier this year on mRNA technology and livestock vaccines. And there are no mRNA vaccines licensed for use right now in beef cattle in the U.S., but there is some of that research and development underway. So we're bringing in a couple speakers to talk about what are the pros? What are the cons? What are some ways that we can step in and recommend actions to take? Um, to ensure that, you know, producers feel comfortable using the products, consumers feel comfortable uh, consuming the products and just putting up sideboards on the use of this technology. It's uh, like any other technology, right? So we've Mm -hmm. got to make sure that it's being used judiciously and in the best interest of humans and animals. So those are some of the highlights we've got. You can go to uscattlemen.org to check out the rest. I'd highly encourage you to do so. We've got plenty of other workshops as well, and we'd love to see you there, Fort Worth, December 1st and 2nd. All right. Well, Leah and Jess, on behalf of Working Ranch Radio Show, I'm glad you guys made the time to do it. I know it's always even tough sometimes to catch up with one of you, let alone both of you at the same time. So I appreciate you guys <laughs> making this happen and giving us an update on what's going on. And uh, folks, again, you know, their annual meeting, the 16th annual meeting for U.S. Cattlemen is going to be December 1st through the 2nd in Fort Worth, Texas. It'll be a great time. Uh, check that out on the website if you want to get more information on that. Guys, thanks for joining us here today on on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you down the road. Thanks for all you do. Stay in it there, folks. Stay in it. And again, my guest today, Leah Biondo, Executive Vice President of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, Jess Peterson, their Senior Policy Advisor. If you want to find out more information about all of the things they are working on or about their upcoming national convention in Fort Worth, Texas, you can go to their website at uscattlemen's.org. We'll stay with us coming up after the break. Captain Tim O'Byrne will be in with this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents and meteorologist Don Day stopping by telling us about what we'll have in store for weather on Thanksgiving Day. Yeah, things are cooling down a little bit, at least for most of the country. We'll talk about what he thinks is going to happen next week with a look at our long-term weather when we return on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Looking for the perfect gift for a gardener or weather enthusiast? Introducing the Tropo, a precision rain gauge that has revolutionized both reliability and convenience. Expertly engineered by meteorologists, the Tropo gauge boasts rugged durability, impeccable accuracy, and precision to the hundredth of an inch. Visit MeasureRain.com to order a Tropo today and use code RAINDAY, that's R-A-I-N-D-A-Y, for free shipping and 10% off. Go to Measure rain.com Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. You know, I mentioned this last week and after I thought about it, I told myself 
uh, that's a pretty good idea. I kind of patted myself on the back a little bit. And it was in regards to buying somebody that you know, a subscription to Working Ranch Magazine as a holiday gift. You know, this week coming ahead of us is Black Friday, where everybody spends, gets up in ungodly times of the day to go stand in line at the local uh, department store so that they can get a good deal on a TV. Well, here, you can stay in bed, you can sleep in, and you can buy your Christmas gift pretty simple. Buy somebody that you know that would enjoy the articles, the stories, the the pictures that all are part of Working Ranch Magazine. You can do it pretty simple. You don't even have to get out of bed. In fact, you can do it on your phone, on your computer. Go to workingranchmag.com and you can start a subscription for somebody. And here's the deal. Every time a new issue shows up in their mailbox, they're going to thank you that they have that magazine and they're going to be appreciative of that gift that you have given them. So think about that. If you want a good Christmas gift idea for somebody, start it with a subscription to Working Ranch Magazine. And boy, I'll tell you, if that's not just a good segue to now hear from the captain, Tim O'Byrne, who is publisher and editor of Working Ranch Magazine for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. Hey, Justin. Hey, everybody out there in Working Ranch Radio Land. Let's go straight to the mailbag. This is from a reader and a listener in Greeley, Colorado. Good morning, sir. I am fairly sure you are all aware of this news. The USDA and the current Biden administration have decided to accept beef imports from Paraguay. This country is a known carrier of foot and mouth disease. Their inspection service is funded by the private sector. It flies in the face of all common sense. This whole idea is very scary, to put it mildly. I appreciate your time. I listen to RFD TV and especially Mr. Mills' show on the weekends. So, Justin, let's do a little digging into this, all right? Um, I did an editorial, oh, geez, it must have been 10, 12 years ago, on uh, the border between Brazil and neighboring countries and how uh, wide open it was. Cattle were walking across, (laughs) basically, from one country to the other. And uh, it's a big concern. So, uh, Justin, why don't you dig into this and and see where it leads. Back to you in the booth. All right. Thanks, Captain. And yeah, you know, as we heard earlier in our show today, Leah Biondo with U.S. Cattlemen's Association addressing that very issue and the concerns that they have on that of bringing in beef from Paraguay. And let me tell you this. There have been issues that have definitely fragmented our ranching industry, but... This one is not one of them. Beef imports from Paraguay is not one of those issues. And I know uh, all of the industry groups that represent the ranching and beef industry have huge, huge concerns with this. And I know they are working on behalf of us here in the countryside. Well, it's time to switch gears now a bit as we head to take a look at our long-term weather. And standing by is meteorologist Don Day as we do that. And Don, we've had some pretty good weather. As I said earlier in the show, we've had pretty good weather the last several weeks. We've been able to get a lot of things done. But as that's been going on, we've been building a pretty good cold air mass up in northern Canada. Canada. But it looks though, as we look ahead into this week, that we could be seeing a change in weather just a little bit as that cold weather moves south. Yeah, we definitely have some changes coming for just about all of the United States, just about all of Canada. Uh, and it really gets started here in the coming days with, as you mentioned, the cold air that has been building in Canada. It's been building up there because the jet stream for a lot of the last two weeks has basically been going west to east across the U.S., keeping milder Pacific air dominating the weather pattern across the U.S. The only real weather we've had has been some really wet weather down in the southeast, Florida, southern Florida, the Gulf Coast, Texas has gotten some rain. But the rest of the nation has had some really quiet weather. But while the quiet weather has been around, That cold air has been building with these short days and those long nights. And we're going to see a release of this cold air across the high latitudes to the low latitudes as we get into this Thanksgiving week coming on up. And for some of you out there listening, this will be the coldest shot of fall so far. And for some areas, it it is looking like the potential for not only some cold November weather, but these are temperatures that we would normally see in midwinter. Mm-hmm. Okay. So one of the issues that we're dealing with a little bit here is we've, as you have talked about before, there's about three different weather models that we watch to see how things, how things are shaping up, whether it's the European model, the U.S. model, the Canadian model. All three of those models definitely show the, so, something happening, 
But just where that's going to take effect, we, it appears as though the continental divide could be potentially a dividing factor. And if you're wanting to go to a warmer climate for Thanksgiving, sounds like west and maybe southwest of the continental divide would be the place to go. But nevertheless, when we look at those three different models, uh, it's just a matter of, you know, maybe how far south that's going to go to some extent, but really seeing some change. Yeah, it's always a situation where the devil is in the details. Uh, the one thing that we are definitely looking at and that we're very confident of is the trend much colder temperatures. It'll be the severity of the cold and the associated rain and snow that will come with it that is always the hardest to sort out. But the the buildup of the cold air over the last several weeks and the change that we're seeing in the jet stream pattern, not only in the Pacific, but the Atlantic, if we were to just go back and look at patterns historically that have been similar, Usually it does result in a pretty significant cold outbreak. And you had mentioned the Continental Divide, and it does look like this particular outbreak is going to go to the Continental Divide of Canada and the U.S., then spread out across the plains into the Great Lakes. And as strong as this cold surge looks like, it's probably going to go all the way into the Gulf Coast areas uh, by the end of Thanksgiving weekend. So you're going to get associated rain, snow, and ice along this cold air boundary that comes on through. This will be a shock to the system for many areas. And livestock interest in especially the northern plains and the northern Rockies uh, really need to be prepared for some some cold. And we're talking about uh, sub-zero temperatures are in line, possibly, with this cold outbreak. Uh, and we've had cold outbreaks, one or two this fall season, but this one, uh, is going to be longer lasting. The cold snaps have been short lived. This one has the potential to go for five to seven days or more. Okay. So with that, how much moisture is going to be coming with it? We do know we're going to see some snow or rain potential areas, depending on what, how far north or south you are. But how much moisture are we talking? Or is it just be going to be primarily just cold temperatures? We always look at the sources of air masses in terms of trying to figure out what the precipitation is going to be like with these storms. With this mostly being what we would call like continental Canadian air mass, you're not going to introduce a lot of moisture from Canada into the lower 48 states. But the big contrast in temperature tends to squeeze out what available moisture there is. So while we don't see what I would call a big snow event coming, light to moderate snow amounts along this Arctic boundary are going to be likely. And that's going to be enough uh, certainly for some accumulations of snow. I would certainly think that what we're going to see is the best chance of that will be in the central and northern high plains, the central Rockies. Uh, but we could see snow maybe as far south as uh, I-70, maybe getting south of Interstate 80 uh, with this outbreak. All right. Well, Don, appreciate you joining us here today on the program and uh, hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. You too. Gobble, gobble. All right. And again, meteorologist Don Day can be found through his website at dayweather.com. If you have questions for him or anything you'd like to get a hold of him on, feel free to reach out to him there. Or if you're looking for weather instruments, weather stations, weather rain gauges, whatever that may be like that, you can go to his website at dayweather.com. And also you'll find the link to his daily video podcast there. Stay with us. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I'll tell you what's in store for next week's edition of the Working Ranch Radio Show. We'll be back after this. You're going to want to join us next week. Dr. Neville Spear will be our guest. He is an industry consultant, and I'll tell you what, he has a wealth of information. We're going to be talking a lot of different topics, not only as we wrap up this year, what he is seeing in terms of the business, supply changes, the sell-off in cows that we're continuing to see, the downsizing of our herd, and we'll also begin to set the stage for what he believes 2024 is going to look like. Join us next week. Dr. Neville Spear will be here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. And real quick, just another subject we are also working on for a show and it's something i have a lot of questions about and have been hearing an awful lot about and that is beef on dairy so be sure to tune in in the month of december for some great shows we have coming up well the working ranch radio show is a production of working ranch magazine branded number one by america's ranchers you can get your subscription easily started today by going to workingranchmag.com if you'd like to get a hold of me questions you might have about the show comments or topics you'd like us to cover please feel free to send me an email at justin.workingranch at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. I'm Justin Mills. And until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long.